Well, if we could begin with reading Scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And while you're getting there, just let me tell you my great appreciation, Dr. Aiken, Dr. Ashford, for allowing me to be here. Uh, it's always a time of refreshing and renewal to be here at Southeastern Seminary. And uh, so thankful to God for all of you here. 2 Chronicles 7, let's start reading with verse 7. And I'd like for us to read an extended uh, passage of Scripture all the way down through verse uh, 22, 2 Chronicles 7, 7 through 22. And if you would, would you please join me in standing for the voice of our King breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Word of God says, As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord in the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. King Solomon offered as a sacrifice 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. The priests stood at their posts, the Levites also, with the instruments for music to the Lord that King David had made for giving thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Whenever David offered praises by their ministry, opposite them the priests sounded trumpets and all Israel stood. And Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered the burnt offering and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar Solomon had made could not hold all the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days and all Israel with him, a very great assembly from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly for they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for the prosperity that the Lord had granted to David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever. My eyes will be there, and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you, and this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on to other gods and worship them and serve them. Therefore, he has brought all of this disaster upon them. May God bless his word to us today. You may be seated. I was almost excommunicated one time, but it was not from any church, it was from Cub Scouts. And it happened when I was uh, maybe seven or eight years old, and 
uh, we had to earn our God and Country badge, one of the many badges that you, you earned in Cub Scouts to wear uh, on the uniform. And the way that we had to do this was to go to uh, a local Methodist church and meet with the pastor there who would talk to us about what it means to, to be uh, God and Country sort of a, a citizen. And I was really excited about this meeting because I had a, a friend who was a classmate who somehow uh, his parents had allowed him to watch a repeat of the old movie, The Exorcist. And so he had come to school and was relaying to us all the things that happened in The Exorcist. This little girl, she's possessed by demons. He says she levitates off the ground, her head turns all the way around, there's creepy voices, there's projectile vomiting, and I was scared to death. And so I couldn't really call a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my pastor in, in our little Baptist church. But here we had this audience with a pastor where after he was finished uh, teaching us, we could just ask any question that we wanted to. And this pastor had talked about the golden rule and he had talked about God's favor on America and he had talked about being uh, upstanding and morally right and all of these things. And then he said, do any of you children have any questions? And I raised my hand and said, can a Christian be possessed by a demon, or will the presence of the Holy Spirit keep a demon from possessing the Christian? And I was hoping for the second answer. And he said, well, I think you uh, need to keep in mind the ancient Near Eastern structure of the personalization of demonic beings representing uh, social structures that were oppressive. And then he started talking about Q and he started talking about, uh, about mental illness. He started talking about all of these issues. And my little eight-year-old response was, yes, but can a Christian indwelled by the Holy Spirit be possessed by a demon? And he said, well, I don't believe that there actually are demons. And my response was to say, oh, but there are. I mean, look here in Mark, you know, and, and uh, started talking about, uh, some, you know, thinking this pastor just isn't aware of what the New Testament teaches. And he said, I know that that is in the New Testament, but I don't believe that particular part of the Bible as historical truth. I don't think there is any such a thing as a demon. I'd never met anybody at that point in my life who would explicitly say that they didn't believe the Bible. I certainly had never imagined that there would be a pastor who would explicitly say that he didn't believe the Bible. But the thing that I remember to be most shocking to me was not his disbelief, but the fact that he seemed embarrassed to be having that conversation because it was entirely beside the point. What the God and Country badge was about for him was not about the truth claims of Scripture, including a supernatural order. The God and Country badge was instead about the way that religion could make us into good people and into good citizens. He wanted us to have just enough Christianity to make us into good citizens, but not so much Christianity that we would be strange in American society. Now, I think about that conversation often because it seems to me that this sort of God and country liberalism is perpetually with us, a form of theological liberalism that can show up on the left or that can show up on the right. As J. Gresham Machen put it in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, back during the fundamentalist modernist controversy, liberalism doesn't care what sort of ideology carries it. All that it cares about is that religion is seen as a means to an end 
any other end than the reconciliation of God with humanity through the shed blood of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And much of this sort of God and country idealism has happened and is with us all the time because God and country is much easier to teach and to preach than Christ and Him crucified. That's one of the reasons why we will often see the passage of Scripture that we just read, or actually one verse from that passage of Scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, preached very often on Fourth of July Sundays in churches or on Memorial Day uh, services or at some sort of a uh, political rally that is seeking to merge God with country. As one scholar put it, Second Chronicles 714 is the John 316 of American civil religion. And that is possible when our focal point is something that has transpired in the past in American history. It requires a focal point of an imagined past of the founding era or an imagined past of the colonial era in which God comes into a covenant with the United States of America or an imagined past of the 20th century in which the United States of America was supposedly in concert with God and has now fallen away from that. Now, if you and I are going to be faithful in the 21st century, we need to confront this text. The context here is a people of Israel returning from Babylonian exile. They are remembering Solomon's reign over the people of Israel. They are uneasy and they are insecure in their standing in their new place. And they are looking backward to promises that God has made, covenant promises that God will keep. This text is not about a bloodless civil religion. It is not about a country acting better or a country praying to a generic God more. This text is about the cross. Notice, first of all, in this text, we see that the cross defines the people of God. If my people who are called by my name. So many times when that text of Scripture is used by politicians or by pastors, the implicit assumption is that the people are the people of the United States of America, the people of the nation. So that what we need is a, is a revival in the nation, which if you follow that through long enough, you'll see what that means is a moral reformation within the nation or a political revolution within the nation. But the text here explicitly says, as God speaks to Solomon, if my people who are called by my name. Who are the people who are called by God's name? It's the people who are gathered there at the temple, the people who are in a covenant with God that God has made promises to, the people of Israel. And the people of Israel are defined by Christ. Paul says in Romans 9, it is from them who comes the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. If my people who are called by my name, he says this in a temple that is not only filled with blood at the moment, it is a temple whose entire history is pointing toward blood. Mount Moriah is the place where Abraham brought Isaac in order to sacrifice him and was given a substitute for Isaac's life. 
It's the, it's the spot of the threshing floor where God had appeared to David and said, I will take one of your descendants and put him on the throne and he will reign forever and ever and ever. It's, a, it's the place where in that temple there is the Ark of the Covenant, which has inside of its very own box the representation of God's promise to Moses of the the way that Israel was to walk in order that through them could come the Messiah. The, The people here are coming before God as people in covenant with God, and they are coming to God through a mediator. Solomon, as the king, is standing before God, and he is pleading for God's presence. He is representing the people here. He is foreshadowing the one who will be the anointed king, the one who will be the mediator between the people and God. The fundamental question that we are going to have to ask and answer about ourselves in the next generation is who are we? When we think about ourselves, what is the first thing that we think about? 2 Chronicles 7 answers that question. Because in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we see a message here that is not about getting America in step with the church. It's about getting the church out of step with America a distinctiveness that is there with the people of God that defines them. You're the people who are carrying my name. You are the people who are in covenant with me, not because of your behavior, not because of your nationality, not because of your history, real or imagined. You are in covenant with me through the mediation of Jesus Christ. You're defined by the cross. But notice secondly, that the cross not only defines the people of God, the cross also defines the the presence of God. You know, a, a God and country sort of civil religion is shiny and happy and bloodless. We can speak about God quite a bit because God is something that is relatively non-controversial because most people believe in some form of supreme being and they can just they can just project whatever their expectations are upon that supreme being but when you have a god who is defined specifically through the cross in which you have human sin coming under judgment and God's mercy coming through sacrifice, that's a different story. And that's what we see here. Solomon is offering up before God through the priests sacrifices so much that the altar cannot even contain it. And The sacrifices here are being consumed by a fire that is coming from heaven, by a glory that is present throughout the temple and a voice that is coming from heaven to God, from God. So much so that God says to Solomon, I will hear from heaven. How will I hear from heaven? It is not when just any group of people get their act together. It's not when just any group of people stop doing bad things and start electing better people. It's, I will keep my heart and my mind here in the temple, the place where I will meet with you. And how does God meet with us? He meets with us through blood. Jesus controversially says, You tear down the temple, and in three days, I will build that back up. The controversy there is not about architecture. The controversy there is because Jesus is saying, the place where God will meet with you is no longer there. 
The place where God will meet with you is here, in this broken body, in this poured out blood, in this resurrection life. And Jesus says, I will build it back up. I will create and I will call together a temple that is not made with hands, a temple that is made up of living stones where God's presence and God's spirit will be there. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Starting in Jerusalem at Passover, he brings together people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language and builds them into what Simon Peter calls a royal priesthood, a temple of the living God. In order for us to be able to move forward in the 21st century, we must understand something about the priority of the church. That the church is not simply a gathering point for people to come together and encourage one another and pool their money for missions. You can do that online. The church is instead a visible palpable representation of the place where God is meeting with his people and meeting with his people through the cross. Just as the people of Israel are coming before God, but they don't dare come before God without blood. We are the people when we gather to worship, we are coming before God purchased by the blood of Christ constantly aware of the fact that we deserve to hear nothing from God except for depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And yet we have heard from, me, from him instead, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because our sins are atoned for through blood sacrifice and we are now made right with God. And then notice also, that the cross here defines the promises of God. If my people who are called by my name will repent, if they will humble themselves, if they will pray, then I will hear from heaven. Often when this text is being talked about or being preached, we assume that what it means to repent, to pray, to humble ourselves is to focus on the sins that other people are committing out there in the country. If only you would repent, then we would be able to have our country back. If only you would humble yourself, then we would be able to get things back on track. That is entirely the opposite of what is being proclaimed here. It is not that God has no concern for the moral behavior of the other nations. God does. He condemns the sins of the Hittites and of the Amalekites and of the Ninevites and others. But God here is speaking to Solomon about the people called by his name, and he is giving a message here that is not one of civil reformation. It is one of gospel. When you come to me here, and when you repent and pray, I guarantee that I will hear you. I guarantee that I will respond to you as a God whose steadfast love endures forever, as a God who is waiting and gracious to receive you back. That's what the text is about. I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. Now, what some people want to do with this is very similar to what the prosperity gospel teachers want to do with Deuteronomy. If you turn on television and you watch any of these prosperity gospel teachers, a lot of Deuteronomy preaching going on there. And here's the reason why. Because Deuteronomy lists out 
all of the blessings for obedience and all of the curses for disobedience. So if you're a prosperity gospel preacher, then what you do is you go to Deuteronomy, you take those blessings and you bypass the New Testament and go directly to the person who is hearing you. If you will obey, here's how God will bless you in terms of material blessings, in terms of physical health. They're trying to get at you without a mediator. I don't care how fundamentalist that prosperity gospel teacher is, he is a liberal. That is what theological liberalism is, to seek to approach God without the mediation of Jesus Christ. Now, what many people want to do is to take a prosperity gospel not directed toward an individual, but directed toward a nation. You take 2 Chronicles 7, I will heal your land, I will save you from diseases, I will save you from destruction, bypass the gospel of Jesus Christ and apply that directly to the United States of America. So that if America would just get right, then America would prosper. We would have financial prosperity and we would have military prosperity and we would, God would bless us in this way. And if we don't, if America doesn't get right, then what God is going to do is to put these punishments here upon the nation. And so we end up with a kind of civil religion in which God becomes the very same thing that all the nations of the world were looking for in their small g gods. Someone who exists to make sure that we are doing well, personally or nationally. But 2 Chronicles chapter 7, as in every other passage of the Old Covenant, comes to a head and comes to a fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. All of the promises of God find their yes in Him. Not only is that true in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the blessings that we have, it's also true in terms of the curses. God says, if you run away from me and you serve other gods, then I will so destroy this place that everyone passing by will say, what happened to this people and why has their God rejected them? That is exactly what happened when Jesus of Nazareth, the fulfillment of Israel, and the substitute for the human race bears upon his own body the penalty for our idolatry and our unfaithfulness. The people who passed by that cross said to themselves, he said that he was the son of God. Where is his God? What must he have done when the Bible tells us that cursed is everyone who is hanged upon a tree? He is bearing the penalty for this, not for his sins, but for ours, so that when he is raised from the dead, God is demonstrating that all of the penalty of the law has been consumed and Jesus of Nazareth is vindicated as the righteous humanity and the righteous God. Now, what that ought to do for us is to free us from fear. There's some people who are so fearful in the culture around them right now that they want to just capitulate and just give up Christian truth. 
There are other people who are so fearful about what's happening in the culture around them that they want to just double down and just respond to the world outside with a kind of anger and self-expression of rage. Both of those are coming out of a place of fear. You and I have the freedom as those who have promises that God will meet us in his temple. God will hear us when we come to him in his temple, the body of Jesus Christ. He is for us in that temple. He defines us in that temple. That we should be the people who are the least given over to fear, personally or culturally because you have the promises of God and his steadfast love endures forever. The worst thing that could possibly happen to you has already happened. It's over. Whatever you're worried about, cancer, getting fired, having a spouse leave you, going on the mission field where people respond to you with violence, That's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Worst thing that can happen to you is not starving to death. Worst thing that can happen to you is not getting beheaded by terrorists. The worst thing that can happen to you is to be crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem under the curse of the wrath of God. That has already happened to you. That is in your rear view mirror. And the best thing that can possibly happen to you is not having the family that you've always wanted. Best thing that can happen to you is not having the ministry that you've prayed and hoped for. Best thing that can happen to you is not having good health and a lot of money. The best thing that can happen to you is being raised from the dead, forgiven of your sins, given an inheritance, seated at the right hand of God. That's where your identity is. You are already there, Colossians chapter 3. So whatever takes place, culturally, socially, politically in the United States of America, as concerned as we are about all of those things, we do not respond as people who are pinned up against a wall facing an existential threat. Our future is not at stake as long as Jesus of Nazareth is still alive. And Jesus is feeling just fine. And so the the fear that comes upon us is over because we know here that God has given us, as Jesus says, someone who is greater than Solomon. This was a kingdom, even with its covenants, even with its promises, as, as so much greater than the real or imagined sort of mythology that so many of us build around the United States. And yet it was temporary. You and I are serving through a temple that can't be torn down in a kingdom that cannot be term limited. And that means that whatever faces us, we will march joyfully and triumphantly through that on mission and we will do that always remembering that we come through blood. We are sinners who are only here by the grace of God, so we will humble ourselves, so we will repent, so we will pray, we will seek the face of God, and we will get back to the gospel that tells us who we are. We will get back to the gospel that tells us where God is and where he meets us. We will get back to the gospel that will enable us to crucify our civil religions and our prosperity gospels. It will enable us to put away all of the golden calves that we so easily chase 
behind. And we will acknowledge even in a time where orthodox evangelical Christianity may seem stranger and stranger in American culture, we don't serve the God of generic American values. We serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. And so when everyone else looks at the numbers of Americans who are identifying themselves as having no religious affiliation and starts to panic about that and saying, are we moving toward a post-Christian America? The only way that you can worry about a post-Christian America is if you assume that what we have had is a Christian America. And the only way that you can assume that we have had a Christian America is if you become a theological liberal because the only way that this nation as a nation has been Christian is by defining Christianity in a way that is one birth short of the kingdom of God. America is at best a pre-Christian America. And so we move forward fearlessly and triumphantly knowing that he has told us who we are. He has told us where to find him, and he has given us promises. He's promised promised us short-term a cross on our backs, and he's promised us long-term a crown of glory, but he never promised us a God and country badge. Never. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for the men and women in this room, for the ministries that you've given to them, for the changing times into which uh, they will be serving and ministering the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you would give them boldness. I pray that you would give them fearlessness. I pray that you would give them a gospel focus, that they would call the people around them not to simply modify their behavior, but to be crucified with Christ and raised to newness of life with him. Would you help us to humble ourselves? Would you help us not to be given over to prayerlessness, but to pray? Would you help us to repent and to see every day our lives as one of repentance? And would you help us to remember that we can come to you through the blood of Christ who stands right now, standing and interceding on our behalf? We ask this in his name, in Jesus' name, amen.